Well, good morning. good morning. How did we go with last week's challenge? Can anyone remember what last week's challenge was? We were to bless at least three people in our week with our presence or our time or our encouraging words or gift. And one of those people was to be from outside of the brothers and sisters in Christ. How did you go with last week's challenge? Well, this morning we move on to the second of the, the habits of highly missional people in Michael Frost's little book that we're working our way through. And we're going to begin this morning, surprisingly, not around the table, but on the sporting field, because that's strangely where my mind went. One of the universal features of modern sport, modern team sport, is what is called the huddle, where players form a tight circle, uh, they analyse the game, they encourage one another, they celebrate together and they strategize. And the huddle was first used in American football. Uh, it was actually invented by a, a deaf player who didn't want the opposition team to see the the tactics that he was signing to his, other, to his teammates and so they, they gathered round in a huddle so that they could strategize together and uh, the other team wouldn't know what they were about to do. And since then, the huddle has been, become a, a key feature of American football, um, much to the discern of many Australians who find that a very frustrating way to play a game of football where you stop and start all the time. But it's used in that game as a way of the quarterback assigning uh, to the offence uh, the next play that's going to happen. And whilst American football takes that huddle to the next level, you'll find some form of it in most team sports. And having watched countless hours of junior basketball, I can tell you pretty well how the basketball huddle works. You'll find one or the other coach calls a timeout. The players who are on the field run to the bench. The players who are on the bench vacate the bench so that the tired ones can sit down on the bench. The coach squats down in front of the bench and all the other players huddle in a semicircle around them. The coach comments on what's going well, on what needs to be improved. He or she puts lots of little X's and squiggly lines on a little whiteboard, and they deliver some final words of inspiration. Before everyone stands, they put their hands in together, they shout the name of their team usually, throw their hands up in the air, and then run back onto the court, newly enthused and ready to play the game. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment what that would look like if I changed the ending up a little bit. Coach gives his final rev up, everyone puts their hands in, they shout the name of their team, and then they all sit back down again in their little huddle. And the opposition team moves on to the court. Or they put their hands in, they all shout the names of their team, and then they nominate one from amongst their midst to go on to the court, while the rest of them enjoy their little huddle. How effective is that one person likely to be on their own? It's going to be very hard for them. And it sounds silly, but I think that's what we often must look like in our churches. The game's going on in the outside world. People are living their lives while we Christians huddle together. We're learning, we're strategizing, we're being encouraged and we're being built up and they're all very important things for us to do together, but rarely actually taking the field. Now, I'm not saying that any of those things are bad in and of themselves. The huddle is good. It has its purpose, but we have to be careful because the huddle is not the game. Christians must fellowship together. We must study God's word together and learn together. We must pray together. We must worship together, encourage one another and support one another and raise one another up. It's great for us to socialise together. Builds unity and builds trust. All of these things are good, but if these things become an end in themselves, 
they prevent us from ever really taking the field. And when that happens, we will fall a long way short of Jesus' commission to us. And that's what this little series is all about. It's about helping us to implement some very simple habits that will help us to leave that holy huddle and to take the field and play our part in living out the great commission of Jesus Christ in our daily lives. You don't have to be in some exotic country somewhere to be doing that. You don't have to be in a training program to be ready to be sent out to some exotic country to do that. We can all do it in our daily lives. Now, all of these habits that we're going to talk about, we, they are in the little book, uh, which you can get online. And anyone can apply them in any context. So today's habit is the second part of that BELLS acronym, EAT, which refers to that ancient Christian practice of being hospitable. Now, all of us know how to eat. All of us have to eat. And for most of us, eating is an enjoyable experience. Now, I say most because we recognise that for some people, it's not an enjoyable experience. It's a daily struggle for all sorts of reasons that fall outside the scope of what we're talking about here today. And in those situations, of course, getting well has to be the highest priority. But for everyone else here, there are very few of us that need to eat any more than we already do. So today's habit is not about eating more, nor is it about eating better. I'm not here to give you some nutritional advice for anyone who thought that was maybe what they were getting this morning. Today's habit is about taking something simple that all of us can already do and becoming intentional about using it for God's kingdom. It's about eating missionally. Eating more will not make you missional. So don't go away with the wrong idea this morning. Eating alone will satisfy your hunger. It won't satisfy any of your desire for relationships and social interaction. And it certainly won't make you missional. Eating with other Christians will satisfy your hunger. It will satisfy that desire for relationship. But it also won't make you missional. If we are to represent Christ here on earth, partnering with his Holy Spirit in his mission on the earth, then we need to be like Christ and we need to use our tables in the same way that he did. Now, there's nothing wrong with us eating together as Christians. So don't go away from this morning thinking that we need to stop doing that. We don't. We need to keep doing those things. They're important. But we need not to neglect following the example of Christ. So what I want us to start with is I want you to think back over your past week. There are seven days in a week and most of us eat three meals a day. Some of you might also eat morning tea or afternoon tea or supper, so maybe you eat more than three meals a day. But all of us, I think, would eat at least 21 times a day. So I want you to think back a week, sorry, not 21 times a day. <laughs> that would be a lot of eating. 21 times a week. So think back over those 21 meals that you have had and picture in your mind's eye the faces of the people who sat at the table with you. Now, by table, it doesn't have to be your dining table at home. It may be a cafe or a restaurant. Or there may not have been a table at all. You may have been eating standing up at a function or on a picnic blanket or, or something like that. Picture in your mind's eye the faces of all of those people that you ate with in the last seven days. Now that you have 
those faces in your mind, I want you to remove from that group all of the other believers and focus your mind's eye on who's left. Were there any left in your group? Were there just one or two? Or maybe you are like many of our number who are very gifted in the area of hospitality and your mind's eye was full of all of the other people that you have eaten with. Many of you, I know, regularly open your homes to newcomers among us and many of you have done that for many, many years and that's wonderful. For some of you, the opportunity to eat with others on a regular basis happens easily and naturally because you are still in the workplace and there might be a lunchroom or a tea room at your workplace. Can I urge you, if there is, to make the most of that opportunity because you will miss it when it is gone, speaking from personal experience. If you're in that situation, don't sit at your desk and eat your lunch. Go out to the lunchroom and mix with other people and talk with other people as you eat together. You know, I regularly catch up with uh, a group from my previous, one of my previous workplaces. And we did so about three or four weeks ago and we'd invited a few extras to join us, some of whom I hadn't seen for quite a while. And we shared a meal together and we instantly fell back into the type of conversation that we always used to have around that workplace lunch table. We talked about family, we talked about work, we talked about religion, politics, ethics, you name it, everything was talked about around that table. And at one point, someone said to me, don't you miss science, Caroline? And I replied, you know what? I really thought I was going to. And then one day, about six months after I left, I suddenly realised that I had not given it a second thought. And the same person said to me, but there must be something about it that you missed. And you know, as I looked around that table, the only thing I could think of, what I said to him was, I miss this. I miss talking to all of you guys every lunchtime. You see, in the secular workplace, I shared lunch with quite a large group of people every day, and it was different people each day. And so I didn't really have to think about this habit very much. It just happened very naturally. It was part of my everyday experience. And if you asked me to do that little exercise that we've just done, I would struggle to remember all of those faces. And when I subtracted the believers, most of the people would still have been there. And the conversation that we had were just so easy and so natural that faith was just an everyday part of that experience. When you're asked, what did you do for the weekend? You tell them, and it's very, very natural. When you talk about raising your family and all of those different things, it's very, very natural to share with others over food. I know it sounds like a very strange thing to say, but actually full-time pastoral ministry makes it harder in many respects for me to be missional because I've lost that contact that I have in many respects. The people that I'm surrounded with now are mostly believers. Um, and the problem with that is that that's not the lifestyle that Jesus modeled, so I need to work harder. There's a question that is posed in Michael Frost's little book that originates with a, another pastor, Tim Chester, how would you complete the following sentence? The son of man came, what? There are three son of man statements in the Bible. Can you think of any of them? The son of man came, yep, to seek and save the lost. That's the first one that most people think of. The second one, son of, some of you said, not to serve, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The third one, 
we tend to overlook. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. So those first two tell us about why Jesus came, to seek and to save the lost and to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. But that final statement tells us about how he came. He came simply eating and drinking. And that wasn't what they were expecting. That final statement is part of a short parable in which Jesus compares the generation that he was living amongst with children in the marketplace who cry out, we played the flute for you and you did not dance, we sang a dirge and you did not mourn. Now, in that parable, the children are the musicians and the singers and they're playing and they're singing out to their playmates. They sing a happy tune and their playmates are supposed to respond appropriately with dancing. They sing a, a mournful dirge and the playmates are supposed to respond appropriately with mourning, but they didn't. And Jesus here likens John the Baptist to that dirge. He lived in the wilderness, he probably slept rough, he wore rough kind of clothing, he ate very unfamiliar basic food. Um, and the religious leaders of the day dismissed him and ignored his message saying that he had a demon. Then Jesus came among them and he came eating and drinking and they rejected him as well. They said he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and of sinners. So caught up were they in their holy huddle, busy creating and observing rules and keeping themselves away from anyone that they believed to be a sinner, that they didn't take heed of John's message of repentance and they didn't recognise the Messiah when he came among them. Neither man was what they were expecting and so in rejecting them both they disqualified themselves from the kingdom of God. Now the example that Jesus portrayed on earth was radically different to the lifestyle that was advocated by the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Their approach in many ways was one of separation and exclusion. It was that holy huddle approach. Jesus, in contrast, welcomed to his table Pharisees uh, as well as tax collectors, sinners, and anyone and everyone who wanted to come. So what can we learn from this approach of Jesus? Well, his first miracle occurred in the context of a wedding. Uh, we learned about that a couple of months ago. And there he turned water into wine. And he did it in some large water jars that were used for the Jews for their, by the Jews for their ceremonial washing. So he took water that was part of a purification ritual that was a symbol of the law and the, the law that set God's people apart from their neighbours. And here in this first miracle, he turned it into wine, a symbol of hospitality. And that wine would later be used as a symbol of the blood of the covenant that would unite Jew and Gentile in Christ Jesus. So here at this wedding, in this first miracle, Jesus demonstrates what the kingdom of God is like and he continues to demonstrate it as the barriers come tumbling down around his table, as he dines with tax collectors, as he accepts the worship of a sinful woman at the table, as he taught from the table about welcoming the poor, and in my favourite eating with Jesus story, he embraces Peter, that disciple who had three times denied even knowing him, and he embraces him back into the fold over a breakfast of fish that he's cooked on the beach. And what I love most about that story is that there is not a moment of hesitation in Peter's mind. He recognises Jesus on the shore, throws himself over the edge of the boat and begins splashing 
towards the shore, knowing without a shadow of a doubt that he will be welcomed back at the table of Jesus. Jesus used the table to break down barriers that separated people within society and he used the table as a place of reconciliation. He surprised people by his choice of eating companions and so should we. You know, in Western Christian practice, hospitality has become a term used to mean catering a meal. But true biblical hospitality means much more than that. It's about identifying with those who are on the outside and treating them like they are part of the inside, part of your community, part of your family. It was often used in reference to strangers, travellers, foreigners, people passing through. In ancient Rome, hospitality was generally extended to those who could provide some benefit to the host. You practised hospitality if you thought it might improve your business prospects or improve your social networks. You certainly wouldn't eat with someone from a different social class and you never ate with someone from a different religion. Jews did not eat with Gentiles um, because they were considered unclean. But Jesus did. He turned all of this on its head, freely eating with anyone and everyone. And that simple act of bringing near and including those who would normally expect to be excluded or forgotten, that act of welcoming strangers, treating outsiders as insiders, was irresistible to many. Think about Zacchaeus, the tax collector. While the people were outside muttering that Jesus would even consider going to the home of such a person, Zacchaeus was already busy. He was busy repaying those who he had previously cheated. He was busy already making plans to give away half of his fortune to the poor. Now, the Bible doesn't record anything in particular that Jesus said to bring him to this point of repentance. Just the mere act of being noticed and of being included was so startling and so satisfying that Zacchaeus wanted to be part of this community. Ben Meyer puts it like this, contact triggered repentance, conversion flowered from communion, not the other way around. We don't wait for someone to come to a point of repentance and then we welcome them into our midst. We welcome them and wait and see what flowers. The final thing that we can learn from Jesus's radical form of hospitality is that it demonstrates what the kingdom of God is like. The Romans practiced a form of hospitality that was based on social rank. So when you came to an event, you would find the host and hostess, if there was two of them, seated at the head of the table and next to them would be the most important guests. And then the next most important and the next and the next and the next. And if you were down the other end of the table, well, you knew what they thought of you. And if there were too many people to fit on the table, then there would be some smaller tables. And again, people would be arranged in order of rank around those tables according to their status. It is little wonder that the Apostle Paul was fuming at the Corinthian church and the way that they were celebrating their love feasts together. Some of them getting in first and eating all the food and getting drunk and others completely missing out their love feasts were resembling more the Roman style of hospitality than anything that Jesus had demonstrated to them. Jesus describes his kingdom as participating 
like participating in a great feast. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and first who will be last. That is a Roman feast completely turned on its head. That's the kind of radical hospitality that Jesus demonstrated the type of radical hospitality that he preached and it's what he lived out. Around the table, Jesus' dining companions experienced the kingdom of God in miniature and that should be the experience of our dining companions as well. So our challenge for this week is to eat with at least three people and make sure that at least one of those three people is from outside the church. And in fact, I would say from outside the wider church, outside of the body of believers. So have a think about how you might do that and who you might invite to eat with you. So. One final word of warning before we close. There is a common trap that many of us, including myself, are often tempted to fall into. Beware of confusing entertaining with hospitality. Do you know the difference? Karen Maines, quite some time ago now, wrote a book called Open Heart, Open Home. And in it, she helps us to understand this difference. Entertaining says, I want to impress you with my home with my clever decorating and with my cooking. Hospitality says, this home is a gift from my master. I use it as he desires. Hospitality, she says, aims to serve. Entertaining puts things before people. As soon as I get the house finished, as soon as the living room's decorated, as soon as I get my house cleaning done, then I'll start inviting people over. Hospitality, on the other hand, puts people first. No furniture, no problem, we'll eat on the floor. The decorating, oh, we may never get round to that. Come anyway. The house is a mess, but you are friends. Come home with us. Entertaining subtly declares, this home is mine. It's an expression of my personality. Look, please, and admire. Hospitality whispers, what is mine is yours. It is very natural for us to want to eat with people who are like us. All of us want to do that. It's easy and it's comfortable. And there are many wonderful things about eating with other believers. But if that's all we do, if we only eat and only socialise with other believers, then we have fallen victim to that holy huddle mentality. And we are passing up a very wonderful opportunity to break down barriers, to build community, to bring reconciliation, and to show others what the kingdom of God looks like. Mission's not that hard when you put it in terms of just sitting around a table and sharing your life with others. There is a place for programs in churches, but Mike Breen of 3DM, which is a mission organisation, reminds us that programs and propaganda were never the way of Jesus. May our lives never be too busy or our hearts too calloused with all of the concerns of the world, to become and to be like Jesus, to do what he did and to demonstrate the kingdom of God in a genuine and personal and relational way by simply sharing a meal with them.